Um, I'm going to do the best I can to condense time so that I can keep us mostly on time today. So uh, we can just go to the next slide. I'll mention that um, for those of you who aren't familiar with me or my background, I've worked at a bunch of places. They're up there. I want to give a special uh, thank you to Salesforce, where I've been for the last five and a half years. Um, they really have been extremely supportive of the opportunity to mentor and support organizations like UX India. And I'm honored that my new employer, Google, also is extremely supportive in these types of initiatives. So one thing I'll mention to everyone is if folks want to reach out, uh, if you want to chat, you want to catch up, you want some mentoring, or if you can mentor me, I'd love to, to do that. So please, please keep in touch. You can go to the next slide. So today I want to talk about um, thinking about the people that we're designing for. And before I do that, I want a, a show of hands. This is a, a simple survey, just asking you how you feel right now. And the survey starts at a one, which is you know, you're kind of low energy, maybe you're sad, maybe you're angry, I hope you're not angry. Um, then there's a three, that's kind of you feel neutral. And then there's a five, maybe you're excited, you're joyful, or at least you're satisfied. So show of hands for people who are kind of feeling a one right now, and it's okay, I won't hold it against you, I promise. See, this is like a social psychology experiment. Okay, we got at least one hand for one. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, how about a number two? So yeah, I kind of like not with, eh, like okay, how about a three? How many people are three? Yeah, there we go, see? Got a lot of threes. Four, how many people are feeling four? Okay, kind of the same, three and four, and how about fives? How are the fives doing? All right, so it looks like we're kind of like around three right now. We'll see what happens as we go through the presentation. So let's go to the next slide. So, and actually you can skip this slide. So I want you to think about the term users, and who are we designing for? And I think there's a, a challenge with a word like users. Let me flip to the next slide. Sorry, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing a lot of fast slides here. When we, when we use the term users, there's actually quite a bit of debate about that term. Folks as, as, as early on in the 1980s, like Liam Bannon, have said, when we talk about people in a way that doesn't reference them as people, it distances, it distances us from them. Kind of like this patient in a quarantine ward at a hospital. You notice that the patient's in a bed, but the doctor who's working with the patient is dressed in this hermetically sealed um, environment, which totally makes sense if you don't want to catch a deadly disease. So when we talk about users, are we maybe encouraging the same kind of thinking? Think about yourself. The last time you said, oh, I have to work on this design because we got feedback from a user who told us this. Well, at the end of the day, users are all us, right? And so what we need to do is we need to try to avoid distancing while at the same time reminding ourselves that we are designing for a purpose. So we'll go to the next slide. I think of it in the context of this image here. So it's an image of a woman, she's in a hospital bed, there's a child with her in the bed, and there's what I assume are family members around. So even though she's clearly the target of an intervention, she's a patient, everybody is with her in her community together. I think when we as designers are thinking about users, this should be the approach that we should use. So let's flip to the next slide. Uh, just to put a little point on it here, uh, information visualization pi uh, pioneer Ed Tufte says there are only two industries in the world that refer to their, their people as users. Uh, those of us in the user experience domain and drug dealers. So I encourage us all to think about users not as a, a bad thing, but as a reminder that we're thinking about people just like ourselves, but there are people in specific contexts trying to achieve specific goals. We're all users at the end of the day, and we need to remember that. And <laughs> I have a lot of slides. So let's talk about understanding the drivers. This is how we can remind ourselves that these users we're designing for are people just like us. In many cases, they are us. The first thing I want to talk about is needs. Understanding user needs is really challenging, and I think it's, uh, it's captured really aptly in this inaccurate quote. Uh, it's inaccurate because Henry Ford never said this, um, at least as far as um, historians have been able to authenticate. But it's a great quote because it feels right. Um, if there's, uh, oh, go back, sorry. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. The idea here is that people don't necessarily know what they need. People only know what they're frustrated with. They know what the problem is. They don't necessarily have the innovation or the awareness of the boundary conditions around what's possible. So we need to help with that process. And, oops, sorry, thank you, Swati. So Henry Ford actually did say this, which is wonderful because it kind of gives a preview to where design thinking came many, many, many years after uh, Ford achieved his success. He said, if there's any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. 
That sounds a heck of a lot like what we talk about in terms of building empathy and in terms of design thinking. So for us, we need to start understanding what's it like to be our users. So next slide. And for those of you who've heard me talk in the past, you, you know that I typically like to start with this method. Um, this is not a methodology presentation, but for those of you who are interested, I encourage you to look up these various methods I talk about. Critical incident technique, critical incident interviewing is perhaps the most fundamental technique we have in our arsenal of tools as UX practitioners. It focuses on the problems that people have and the goals they are trying to achieve within the context in which they're operating. It focuses on just getting a description from somebody, asking them what actions did they take, and then understanding what were their feelings, and what was the outcome, and would they do anything differently. We're not saying, hey, invent a better way. We're simply saying, what's your life like right now? And as accurately as possible, can you recall that? So critical incident uh, is a wonderful way to start assessing the needs of our users. Another way is through Kano model. The Kano model is a, um, it's basically a way of understanding how people feel about features and functions within our products and our services. We basically are trying to assess whether or not people are satisfied by what we're offering. And also, we want to make sure that we don't offer them anything they don't want. So typical questions when you're doing Kano surveys or Kano interviews are questions, oh, that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Adobe. Um, <laughs> so what we're doing is we're basically making sure that if we implement a certain feature or a function, that people say, yeah, I really want that. That sounds really, really good to me. And if we say, what if this product didn't offer it? They say, no, I don't like that idea. It's making sure that we can verify our requirements with what the actual needs are of folks. So we go on to next. So let me just ask a show of hands. How many people have a laptop? So OK, this is just like a reality check for Steve. Now keep your hands up if you have a PC. So PC laptop, that's your primary laptop? All right, now how about Apple? Apple laptop, look at that, yeah, interesting. So I'd say it's like one third, two third ish. Um, for those of you who have an Apple, why do you have an Apple, not a PC? I think for the amount of money you're spending on the Apple, you could easily get a PC with more power, more memory, more, um, more hard drive space, probably cooler accessories offered by really, really inexpensive vendors. So why do you have this Apple? Anybody? Experience? Usability? Easy to use and handy, convenient. Turns on fast. How about does anybody use a, an Apple product because it's, it's part of your identity as a designer or a UX practitioner? Interesting, like only two hands went up. Um, this has changed. I've asked this question in the past, and I've, I've noticed a shift going. It used to be kind of all Apple all the time, and now it's a lot more, um, a lot more distributed. So let's flip to the next slide. When you were answering that question about what, the, what kind of computer you're using, it's interesting that most of you answered with items that are toward the bottom of what Steven Anderson refers to as the hierarchy of UX values, um, it's a hierarchy of UX needs. Steven Anderson, author of a great book called Designing, um, uh, sorry, Seductive Interface uh, Design, basically says that like Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, there's a hierarchy that we have of UX needs, and that starts with things like functionality, like having products that are actually meaningful and useful. But then it moves into things like usability, convenience, et cetera. And then finally, it gets into things like pleasure and meaning. If an item that I'm using isn't pleasurable to use and isn't meaningful to me, what reason do I have to continue using it if something more meaningful and pleasurable comes down? OK, next slide. So how do we get at understanding these values? I think it comes down to the, the, the asking of a simple question, why? So in order to assess values, next slide, lots of slides here, sorry, Swati, uh, is, is laddering. Many of you have uh, heard this referred to as the five whys, right? It's basically asking questions like a two-year-old child. Why, 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 why? When you ask somebody why they use something, why they prefer a certain product, they're going to give you an answer. The answer usually is an attribute. It's fast, it's convenient, it's, um, it's handy not going to tell you the value for why they use that. In order to get to the value, you have to go down this chain. So you might have to ask why many, many times. And so laddering is a technique where you keep asking why, but in different ways, so the person you're asking doesn't get super annoyed with you. And by getting to the end of it, eventually you'll get question, answers like, um, I like this product because it's fast, and because I'm paid by the, by the number of tasks I do, 
and because it's important for me to um, make money so I can feed my family, this product is helping me be a better uh, caretaker for my family. That's more of a value as opposed to it's fast, right? So keep asking why. Don't be satisfied with the first answer. Another technique is just listening. And I think uh, Tim is going to be giving a workshop that covers some of this uh, later today. Listening is a technique that, that's been um, popularized by Indy Young. She wrote the uh, awesome book, Practical Empathy. It's basically turning the idea of an interview on its head. And basically, your job is to sit there and literally listen to a person talk about their experience. You might ask questions, but you're asking questions that are more guiding. You're not asking to solve your problems. You're asking questions to understand what are your principles and your values that drive your decision making. So again, let's do this. Uh, how are we doing in terms of uh, the room's emotion? How many people are feeling like a one right now? Whoa, we lost the one. OK, how about a two? Twos, people still like, eh. All right, three. Yeah, we still got some meh. OK, how about four? All right, we got more fours. Oh, that's awesome. And how about five? Yeah. <laughs> we got very enthusiastic fives, even though you're still a, a subset. OK, so it looks like we're moving to a four. So we've kind of gotten from a, maybe a two and a half to three. Now we're at a four. Let's continue going. By the way, I'm not asking these questions to make me feel better. So don't feel like you have to raise your hand to, to indicate that you're having a good time. Um, one thing that's really important is to ask yourself when you're designing products, what is the emotional state that I'm evoking from my users? One way to do that is exactly what I've been doing today. And that's just asking people. Research has shown that asking people actually correlates pretty well with what their actual emotional feelings are. Sure, in certain contexts, people will misrepresent their feelings. Maybe they won't even know what their feelings are. But in general, over time, people are very good judges of what their feelings are. Self-reporting emotional state typically includes things like valence. You know, do you feel negative? Do you feel positive? And also intensity. How strongly do you feel this? So in my question to you all, I'm not asking about intensity. You kind of have to um, uh, include intensity with the one to five measure. Although as somebody over here, when they said, yeah, for the number five, that, in that indicates some intensity for me. So really helpful. Let's go to the next slide. Another way to do this is actually completely disintermediating the process. Biometrics have come a long way. And with machine learning and with modeling, biometrics has, have actually gotten to a point where they can start um, assuming you have the right equipment, assuming you have the resources to pay for these systems, you can start discerning what your user's experience is based on their facial expression, based on their GSR, basically how, how sweaty um, their hands or their feet are. You can, if you look at their blood pressure, things like heart rate variability and pupil diameter all give indications of emotion or at least level of arousal. Really, really beneficial things. So the last thing to, um, to be aware of is context. So context, as you can see here in this image, this is an image of a person driving, I assume, to work, using their mobile device while putting on makeup, looking in the mirror. If you don't understand the context of your user and the context of use, you might be making decisions that lead to a poor user experience, or in certain cases, promoting negative behaviors. So understanding context is really key. So how do we do that? One is show the journey. Understand the journey. Many people have probably done journey mapping. If you haven't done journey mapping, just ask yourself, what's the experience that my users have as they engage with my product? And if you don't know, um, you know first I have onboarding, then I have setup, then I have um, configuring a bunch of stuff. If you don't know what those phases are, just do a simple framework of before, during, and after. So before they use your product, while they're using your product, after they use your product. Start there. Start small. Then ask yourself, what actions are users taking? What thoughts do they have? What emotions are they feeling? And then what opportunities do you have as a UX practitioner to improve that experience? Another thing to think about is, what are the emotions along this journey? As many of you depicted in your, in your votes from one to five, emotions don't just happen and then they're gone and they stay there forever. Emotions change. We're, we are protean. We're always changing. So ask yourself, how are feelings and thoughts and associations changing over time? Sometimes our, our users have associations with our product simply because of the name. Maybe it's a brand that you don't identify with. Maybe if I say Apple, you naturally feel positive or negative if you're a PC person. So what are the associations? So let's talk about some techniques that you can use to, to get at that. One is empathy mapping, right? Promote empathy. Many of you have already done this. You just draw a diagram that says, what people say, what people think, what people feel, and what they do. 
If you can do this by phase, that's great, but if you simply just take your product team and say, hey, let's figure out what it's like to be this user. What are they saying as they use our product? What are they thinking? What are they doing and what are they feeling? It's a wonderful way to start the journey toward understanding what it's like to, to live in their shoes. So again, last time I asked you all this question, how many people are feeling like a one right now? Okay, no one, no one reverted, thank you. Uh, number twos? Number threes? Come on, honesty people. Okay, so still got some threes. Fours and fives. Okay, so I still say the fours have it, which is great. Basically, over time, we need to measure how emotions change. Flip to the next slide. And there we go. By looking at how emotions and how a person's experience changes as they interact with your product, you're doing what uh, this map kind of shows that scientists are doing for the world's oceans. This is a salinity map showing you the amount of salt the relative proportion of salt in the world's oceans. Scientists are looking at this to understand impacts to local ecosystems, to understand whether or not humans are having influence, whether or not climate change is changing the salinity, which might have an impact on fish and the kinds of um, wildlife and farming that we can do in those locations. You need to do the same thing for the experiences that your users are having. So track achievements. So most of, you, most of you probably have an idea of whether or not users are being successful, but if you don't have an overt mechanism that says, we know X percent of our users who use this product are successful, think about how to get there. Track goals, track usage, track um, engagement. Are people, when they use your product, are they just kind of checking it out and leaving, or are they excited? They're maybe using it for hours. Ideally not addicted to it, that's a dark pattern. We don't want to encourage that. But are people getting out of their experience what they hope to be? Uh, also track adoption and satisfaction. What specific areas of the product are working well versus not well? Another thing to think about is key moments. So if you're already tracking goals and outcomes, think about stepping it up a level and looking at key moments. What's the most important moment in your product? So assuming onboarding is critical, right? So everybody needs to make sure that on, you know, users understand how to use your thing. After that, what's the key moment? What keeps the defining experience emotionally in the heads of your users? If you don't know that, then think about what kind of research can I do to discover this? We want to know, is it the beginning of their use? Is it the end of the use? Do people have peaks along the way of using my product? And then also, are there moments of delight versus moments of pain points? The moments of delights might be opportunities that you as a UXer can extend. The moments of pain, obviously you want to reduce them, but at the very least, if you know something's painful, some configuration experiences just aren't fun, and they never will be. So maybe what you can do is find a way to offset that by increasing the delight moments before and after to kind of um, make the pain a little less salient. And then one thing I encourage all researchers, designers, developers, managers to do is socialize. It's really critical to be mindful of what's going on with what we know for the user experience and how are we changing that in the future. So review the key moments. Hey, we know our key moment is this. And based on a recent study I did, I learned that you know, it's not working well. Or based on our engagement data that I see from my product usage, we're actually losing a lot of our users here. So understand and communicate and socialize what's happening uh, with your experiences. Use the journey map as a centerpiece. Uh, share your stories and themes and engage everybody. If you have people working in customer service, if you have people working in agency, if you have people in marketing, everybody should be part of the user experience journey. It's a team lift type of project. Uh, so the last thing, before, before I let you go, uh, what next? So I want you all to think from your user experience journey, wherever you are, maybe you've got a super detailed journey map. Maybe you've never heard of the term journey map. What can you do next? Think about challenging yourself with one of these things. Maybe identify a critical user profile that you haven't yet worked with. Maybe you're focused on, this is our MVP, but what about somebody else? Well, we focus on this sales user, but what about this administrator? Think about who's a critical user. What's their context of use? Maybe you've been focusing on mobile design, but maybe think about somebody who's actually using this product on a desktop. Maybe you've only looked at design that's tethered to a workplace. Maybe now look at it if your user was in a, um, in a parking lot or commuting. Uh, understand your user's values, needs, and emotions. Think about what's the journey. Think about what are my key moments. All of these are potential challenges that you can take as you move down your own journey in your user experience in learning about what it means to think of our users as humans. And with that, I'm going to say this will help us all 
achieve what Dana Chisnell, a usability expert, has said. If you want your users to fall in love with your design, you as a team and as an organization need to fall in love with your users. And the way to do that is to remember that we're all human. Remember that we have emotions, needs, values, goals, contexts, and make sure that everybody in your organization also is aware of that information. So the last slide that I have is just a set of resources. So I love these books. So if you're, if you're looking, um, Steven Anderson, Seductive Interaction Design, awesome book with some design guidelines on how to think about promoting emotion and engagement. Uh, Patrick Jordan, great book. I still consider it to be the Bible of research for understanding emotion and pleasure in product design. Don Norman, of course, Emotional Design, Why We Love or Hate Everyday Things, sets up a wonderful argument for why the experience, the affect, the emotion that people have will carry through the experience journey. And then finally, uh, Aaron Walter's Designing for Emotion is a great set of guidelines and principles to help us better understand and capture emotion as we design. And the last slide. Here's my information. Uh, Y'all probably know how to get in touch with me. If not, just look for the various uh, lead generation marketing activities that UX India has been sending out. Uh, my one request that I make of everybody is if you send me a LinkedIn request, add a note explaining why you're doing it because I get thousands of requests and I don't know who's a human and who's a bot. So if you don't tell me who you are, like if you sent me a note three years ago at UX India and I don't remember who you are, you're probably still sitting in my inbox. Send me a new one and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I saw you here. I'd love to connect. I'd love to, to help folks out. Thanks a lot, folks. I hope you have a wonderful conference.